Welcome back to Diane Andrews in black and white. And you see we're still six foot apart, as you've seen most of my <laughs> shows are. This is medical doctor Andrea Brown, who also has some PhDs too, and she's a licensed minister. And she is a fellow from the American Academy of Family Physicians, a board certified family physician, who came from Georgia. Her father was in the Army, yeah. who had roots in Louisiana and brought her back from Georgia to live here, and she was a valedictorian at Glen Oak High. She also went on to LSU Medical School after she finished college. And then she became her own practice the last 15 years in Plaquemine, the anointed medical practice, or what, what's anointed, the proper name? Anointed Family Medicine, LLC. Okay, so we want to congratulate you for all your accomplishments and all the, she's a Delta, but she's in pink today, right? I'm an AK. I was forced to do it. it, it yeah, she was forced to do it. She just was forced kidding. to do it. But neither one of us are active anyway. We're too busy. I just got out of running a, a 80 person healthcare, a home health, geriatric home health agency. And, right. And while I was writing and doing other things. But let's talk to you about your experience with patients and with your own experience having the disease yourself. Tell yes, us about it. Well, in family practice, whoever comes through the door, it's my job to take care of them. And I would say about early February to mid-February, or even way back in January, there was this illness that hit Plaquemine that uh, the symptoms were a severe cough, a cough that had people, I would say, incapacitated for at least a few days, fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, fever. It lasted for at least a week or so, and we tested them for influenza, for um, and you know, that's a for, swab test, it, right? And as this one is now also, right? Right. Because we're going to look at your testing uh, kit. I think you bought it with you. We'll yes, get it after the break. Yeah. But uh, what was so mysterious about this is that we couldn't put a name to it. You know, it was not influenza. It was not strep. And um, I have a, a lab core lab in my office, and they had the ability to do viral swabs or respiratory swabs. So we swabbed people, you know, just to see what this was. And every time, I'm not gonna say every time, but I'll say 90% of the time I swabbed someone with this mysterious illness, nothing uh, developed. So it was just like, okay, what is this question mark illness that has so many people ill? So around the same time, many people in my office actually became ill, either with symptoms of diarrhea, fatigue, cough, bronchitis that after about a week or so, maybe a week and a half, it subsided. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, you know, at that time had a couple of patients to even, you know, be so ill that they required home oxygen. And one of them had to be on a ventilator, but we couldn't put a name to it. Did any of your patients pass away from this, at that time, mysterious disease, Dr. Brown? Actually, two. But and we just attributed it to, okay, this person had renal disease. Were they so older? Older, over 65. Mm -hmm. uh, renal disease, heart disease, so we just attributed it to, okay, you know, maybe it was uh, cardiovascular, maybe mm -hmm. it was renal, but we did, had no idea that, and I'm, I'm, actually we can't prove it until we start doing the serology test that, yeah. okay, that's what this was. So we kind of, we're waiting to see so we can come, you know, bring about, you know, 30 or 40 people in who I knew had this illness to say, okay, let's do this uh, they were saying, serology Dr. test Burke, to see what this today is. that they were going to start doing more serology tests allowed and getting them out right. there for people to actually do that. But I know it's not available. No, they said as the next two weeks. Right. They so said I'm the next waiting two weeks. for it. Yeah. Don't worry. We're yeah. all waiting for yeah. it. Yeah. And that way we can say, okay, you know, it's proven. That's what we had. And, uh, you know, let's move on. And can't, won't that help us uh, determine more of a herd immunity and also really help people like yourself? Could, aid with the convalescent plasma, right. uh, exactly. which has known to, it helped people with the Spanish flu, right. which kills so many, almost a mi 100 million people. Right, and even, um, I know they tried it in, on a patient in Treeport, Louisiana, right. actually. And, and that person survived, uh, yeah. Right, and became better. So yeah. we're all waiting, and you know, sometimes we get uh, so anxious for the cure, 
and we're just waiting for the technology, so we're all waiting here. They have tried it in other places, but we're waiting right here in Baton Rouge, except uh, in other places, to, uh, I guess, to use it, to try well, it out. Also, the vaccine they're working on, there's a doctor, Dr. Corbett, who happens to be a black woman out in Seattle, Washington, that has mm -hmm. already injected with the vaccine. They're using, they, they took mm -hmm. some of, you know, a, car, uh, a coronavirus, and mm -hmm. some, she was working on SARS. Mm -hmm. And they took some of the elements from SARS and were able to put it into this vaccine for this coronavirus. And they injected the first person as a test, which is going to still be a year to, yeah. to test the vaccine. But they've already started injecting. And right. I'm, we're going to have her picture up here, Dr. Corbett out of Seattle. Okay, awesome. And uh, her, her picture will be on the screen. So they've already started injecting people. That's the quickest I've seen a vaccine get out. And, and they were saying that what they're going to try to do after six months in, they're going to ask, and the government's going to help fund whatever, lab and labs or some pharmaceutical mm -hmm. company, because what happened with Ebola, by the time we got the vaccine out, it was no need right, for it at that right, time. Right. So they're going to, because they don't want to take a risk, and you know, you don't know for a year if it's really going to work. Exactly. So they're going to say, if 75 percent, let's go with it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how, what, what time of the month in February, or was it March, when you contracted the, the disease? I would say late February, early March. And you knew about the disease then? I knew about it, but... At the time, listening to what they were saying on CNN and on the television, they were saying, well, this is a, a disease that's going to have a high fever. You will have a fever of 101, 102. So when I didn't have a high fever, I said, well, maybe that's, you know, this isn't it. Maybe this is something else. Mm -hmm. But now, two months into it, when I have patients come to the office and, you know, they're testing positive without fevers. And now I realize that, you know what? There's a transient fever that many people get, but these fevers are not, uh, are not lasting. So if you have people who are coming to your jobs and your only mode is, let's check your temperature. Right. A lot of people who are testing positive actually have normal temperatures in my office. So to me, I know it's a criteria, but you're going to miss a lot of people if you're only uh, using that requirement of a temperature. How else, though, could you determine? Would there be a checklist that you would, could make up? Well, or a, a, do you have now, nausea? Do you have, now that it's yeah. about... I would say six to eight weeks in, mm -hmm. I listen. I have people who have come to test positive and their symptoms were mostly GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. No respiratory. No respiratory at all. Severe abdominal gastro. cramps. So More it sounds gastro. like a mm -hmm. gastroenterologist. Yeah. And I've had a, a few people say, oh, I had food poisoning. There's probably something I ate the other day. But I sat them down. I said, well, what did you eat? Did you eat something that you, don't, that you hadn't eaten before? Yes, you have a fever. You look sick. You have an abdominal pain. Let me test you, by the way, for COVID just to see. I said, I need you to, uh, to self-isolate, but let me test you because I have a group of people who only had GI symptoms to come back positive. Let me test you. But did you. you say they had a fever? Did you say that person had a fever? They, they had a fever at home, but... When they were at my office, they didn't have a fever. Oh, Not really? everybody had a fever. That's right, the thing. Right. The fevers are transient. Yeah. So they may have had a fever for maybe 24 to 36 hours. And, you know. And you've had 60 patients. At least. At if, least. If you had to put them in three categories as far as the signs, what would they be, Dr. Brown? I would say fatigue, fatigue, fatigue. All that three. was the one symptom that most of them had is fatigue. And I would say after fatigue, it would be cough, mm -hmm. fever, now, did you have a cough? body aches. I had a cough. Uh -huh. I had terrible back pain. I had a headache. I had nausea. Did and you vomit? Was it nausea and vomit or just No nausea? vomiting. No vomiting, just nausea. Mm -hmm. But the nausea was just uncharacteristic. Uh, the headache was daily, a daily headache for two weeks. Now, did, did you self-quarantine yourself for those two weeks, Dr. Brown? I, I took precautions, but this was before we had COVID tests. This was yeah. before yeah. COVID was out. Right. So I, uh, you thought I it was stayed the flu? home. Did you think it was the flu? What did you think? Well, I tested myself. I oh, did the a flu. strep test. I did an influenza test. Yeah. I, um, I had uh, doxycycline at home yeah. already, so I took doxycycline, and I would say when my cough uh, was better, you know, I went back to work, but my, that's just, an antibiotic for right. people that don't know. Yeah, and uh, yeah. as a physician, we tend, I'm not going to say we all self-medicate, but, <laughs> you know, I do keep. So a, you didn't go to another doctor. <laughs> you didn't visit a no. doctor. Yeah, you didn't you need know, to. Because yeah. I, you know. Yeah. 
Well, there's this saying that says, <laughs> physician, heal thyself. So right. that's the slogan yeah. I use for myself. And I don't blame you. Yeah, yeah. I was married to a doctor. I, he never went right. to a doctor. So, and I didn't either. And I do I have a PCP, him. but, <laughs> yeah. you know, I have to use my PCP when my uh, health plan says you better go and get that, uh, that annual. But other yeah. than that, you know, a lot of times it's just, you know, when you take off work for, what, six hours just to go to one appointment. When you know what's wrong with you anyway, exactly. and you can, can write that prescription. You know, yeah. so I would say the one thing that stood out for me is that a headache daily for two weeks with nausea daily for two weeks, lower back pain that did not lit up. So I knew I was dealing with something and the fatigue was so severe that, How you could know, you work if you were so tired and fatigued? How did well, you manage to work? I'm a single parent, I raised three children, and when you're so used to going, when you're so used to doing, when uh, I think, back in college, I had my first child. I may have stayed out, what, 10 days? I went right back to, uh, to <laughs> Dillard University and finished. So I think I was just used to, you know, yeah. like they say, lead while bleeding. I was just so used to leading. I was so used to going that, you know, what, what <laughs> I would say debilitate the average person that's how you that accomplish so right. much. Yes, right. yes. I was, you know, especially when you have people that say, oh, you, you got pregnant? You're never going to be that doctor. And oh, that made you have work this, harder. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, yes. this tenacity. You know what? We're both Aquarians. I must, I know, yeah, don't I challenge must keep you. Going. Yeah. I must keep going. It's yeah. almost like when you're watching, um, you know, the superheroes that, oh, he was stabbed, but he got up. And that yeah. was me. I was just tenacious, and I yeah. didn't let... Well, with you always wanted somebody, to be a doctor, Dr. Brown? Or? I was told I was four years old when I told whoever was in the room that I'm going to be a doctor. And it was just, I guess you would say, a God-given... You know, um, yeah. You know, something I interviewed God, a little girl who's a, a junior astronaut. When she uh, was five, uh -huh. she told her daddy, I'm going to Mars. Well, and she's on the slate four. now to go to I Mars. She four. is. She never stopped. So it was like you. Yeah, so some not, some voice prophetic. inside God yeah, told definitely. you what you need so to do. So maybe a prophetic voice at the age of four spoke and said, you know said, how did she even know what Mars yeah. was? You know, but, she was four uh, or five years old. I never let anything stop me. So even when I felt bad, I went to work. Yeah. Even when I was, you know, I got to work and I said, you know what, God, give me the strength to do this. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't coughing at the time. I was just tired. Mm -hmm. I was fatigued. And I would normally walk my dog every day, but to walk the dog... You know, it was a little pressure. You know, what I would normally do a couple now, of blocks, but yeah. I was like, okay, let me do one and a half instead of two Have blocks. Have any of your and, patients seen the same symptoms? You had the extreme fatigue. Yes, extreme, and that's extreme. what made me test yeah. Yeah. more than what I would say, like the ER, for instance. They didn't want to test a person unless that person had a fever, unless that person had this criteria that was mm -hmm. on paper. But I'm like, speaking from experience, the fatigue, yeah. It's that one thing that, you know, we had that person say, something's not right with me. Yeah. I'm so tired. I had a cough, but the cough is gone. I had a fever, but the fever's gone. But I'm just so tired. My belly hurts. Yeah. My uh, head and back pain. I'm like, you know what? And well, I just, think before, not only that, it was, it the was red so eyes new. Too. Doctors hadn't been around right. this and didn't know it is right. a new strand of coronavirus. Right. Now, how long have you had the test ability in your own office? How long have you had the testing kits? Well, actually, what people don't realize is that Right around the end of January, early February, when I had a ton of people to come in sick and I couldn't put a name to it, I talked to the uh, representative at LabCo. I said, I have an illness that is in this office that I can't put a name to. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to do respiratory panels. Send me 150 respiratory panels. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, it was the exact same test that they're using for, for COVID. COVID. So yeah. while all these other places didn't have tests, I had at least 200 tests in my office. But that was smart on you because a lot of doctors didn't even know they could test and they just passed today that pharmacies now are going to be able to test. You're going to be able to go into your pharmacy right. in a couple of weeks and mm -hmm. test right there like we do, you know, a lot of other things right in the pharmacy or take your, your TB right. or pneumonia shot. So you've been testing since January. Technically, COVID. yes. Yeah. It's just that I wasn't testing for COVID-19. But you did the respiratory panels. The yeah. lab says, okay, now that same test that you've been doing on all we these people name. for the last six <laughs> weeks, it's the same test, but put this test code. And yeah, we got an ICD-10 right, for it now. Right. Yeah, and we're going to add, gonna add yeah. uh, you know, the CPT code. Yeah, yeah. We're going to add the COVID test yes. onto everything that you've been doing. And you've had six, how many people tested positive? I know you've at had least, six in the hospital. At least 30. 
Well, 30 to, uh, 30 to 50 to test positive in my office. Okay. Now, let's talk about that. In Louisiana, we know we've had 753 deaths. We've got about 19,000 plus 253 people with it. Right. And, um, and those are the people who have been tested. Right, who have I would with say it right twice now. Twice as many, if not more, well, that have actually had the disease that just weren't tested. But we could say that for any oh, yeah, place in the world. Definitely. That we, we've tested 2.1 million, which is more than every place else. But right, for, yeah, right, the United right. States has. We have 473 on vents, and they said there was a problem with vents. Uh, right. the in Louisiana, the first third, one third of our events didn't work for COVID. It couldn't couldn't last long enough. On, on, well, anyway, problems. Yes, ma'am. And I think every state had problems. The national had problems. The FDA wouldn't mm -hmm. let uh, academic and private labs test right. when the first started, which was the craziest right. thing I read. So right. the FDA had had you had to send a CD ROM in. My God, is that 20 years ago? So they still had <laughs> rules from 20 years right. ago for people to send in. That was part of the problem with the right. testing. Exactly. Was really the FDA was the problem and their sister company, the sister agency, the CDC. But so we've had all these. We have 2,000 people now, 2,000 plus 2,053. I think we just lo looked and saw in the hospitals in our mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. Now California, 40 million people again has the same amount of people with it as we do. And they're, they think they've come over the hump and they're being, mm -hmm. I don't know, but they're saying right. they're, they're coming over the hump. Them in Washington, even though they've been mitigating much longer than us, probably right. a month longer, because right. as we know, it came in from Wuhan to Seattle. Right. And that's when we stopped the borders, you know, stopped China from being able to enter the borders when the administration did. Come on back, you all, to Diane Andrews in black and white. Let's finish talking about uh, firsthand knowledge of the COVID virus. Come on back and let's hear from Dr. Brown some more. back to this very interesting and informative show. This is stuff you need to know to survive. Dr. Brown, you were telling us about the Catholic Charities when we took break. Tell us a little bit more about that. I would say about six weeks ago, I received an invitation from um, the Daughters of Catholic Charities at St. John Church in Plaquemine, Louisiana. And I spoke to a full room of, I would say, older or some elderly um, Caucasian women, and they wanted to know information about COVID-19. They wanted to know what do we do? How do we protect ourselves? In Louisiana, 70% of the people are over 65 who, who have right. contacted, contracted right. COVID. So yeah. this was a group of women who at the time, uh, and as I was telling them that day, I said, well, it looks like this may be a problem for the people that are in this room because you are older. Mm -hmm. You may have medical problems, but it looks like from what they're telling us that younger people may be spared. So I really want you to understand about hand washing, about isolating yourself, about making sure that you're not visiting nursing homes at this time, because we don't want this to get out. So I answered questions. Mm -hmm. I provided them with information. Mm -hmm. And I will say this as far as stats or as far as what we're seeing in Plaquemine, Louisiana, that group of the population actually looks like they're doing better as far as numbers, mm -hmm. as far as mm -hmm. the statistics that we're seeing in Plaquemine. And I would attribute that honestly, to education. Right. They asked for the information. I was happy to give it to them. But the thing is, they asked. And I would say as a people, and as people in general, we should not be afraid to ask if the information is there. One person, I will say my father, for instance, uh, he's no longer here, but as far as disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, heart disease, he, I would say, probably died with a cigarette in his hand. Did he die from cancer? He had a cancer, but he also had a defibrillator. So I want to say uh -huh. he died of a cardiac illness, uh -huh. but not only I told him about, you know. What, but he had high cholesterol what, also. How did he eat? Whatever he wanted. Was he overweight? Very thin, very really? thin. Well, maybe that made him eat yeah. what he wanted, yeah. Very thin, but he just didn't listen. I would say multiple physicians told him, if you don't stop smoking, you're gonna die early death. And he even lit up a cigarette at the Baton Rouge General Mid City <laughs> with the oxygen in the room. He could have blown up the whole room. But <laughs> just, he did what he wanted to do. And I was so embarrassed because 
I had a phone call from one of the staff members saying, your father tried to smoke in the hospital, and I was like, oh, God. But you do know. you think that's part of the problem that 70% of, of people with this are black in our state and in Milwaukee and in Chicago? And mm -hmm. uh, but do you think and, and the majority are men that are dying from COVID-19 all, all over. Mm -hmm. So do you think that part of our problem is that we're not listening? Men may not listen as they should or may not accept or may not reach out to get the information if they don't get it. Well, I would say this. About, Maybe about 15 to 20 years ago, that was this so, uh, called thing called download, that yes. I might have this illness, but I don't want anybody else to know what I have because <laughs> it's going to you know, make me look bad. It's going to ruin who I am. And this is not the time, if you have COVID, to be on the download. Right. This is the time for you to open your mouth because I had a patient to tell me, well, yes, I have the virus, but don't tell my relative even though they live in the same house as me, because I don't want them to be concerned. What? It is your duty to tell the people in your household what you have, because what you have can hurt them. Was that the one that went to work? Is that the one that went on oh, to no, work? Oh, no, that was somebody else. Oh, wow. But I had another instance. I tested someone. I said, you have symptoms of COVID. I'm going to test you. I need you to self-isolate. I need you to stay home. Of course, I got his test result back. Early Monday morning, also on that Sunday, I'm calling. I'm calling, trying to find him. I finally found him. He was at work, at work, <laughs> at a chemical plant, at work, without a mask, without protection, without PPE. And I said, didn't I tell you to stay home and self-isolate? And he said, well, I didn't think I had it, so I went to work. Huh? But that is not how we protect our neighbor. This is a spill kit. I did not take it from the, the, the chest <laughs> that needs it today. In my home health, we had some there that I keep in case of an emergency. Um, this is what's in a spill kit. These are the gloves that come in PP, personal protective equipment, in case you've never seen it. And you've been wearing some of it, but may not know what the acronym, acronym stands for. These are goggles, in case uh, mm -hmm. that a lot of people wear. These are rest N95 masks. Mm -hmm. This is N95, and today they announced uh, in that daily briefing they have created machines that can sterilize these, and we yeah. use them 20 times. So they will start. We don't need as many N95s as we thought we were right, going to. Right. Plus, the models weren't exactly correct. We didn't need enough anything as we thought we were right. going to with the 3 million that were supposed to die a month ago, and now it's 60,000 a day, which is a good thing. Right. But um, me being a mathematician and you being a, a doctor, the models seem to be a little off to say well, the I least. attribute that to prayer as well. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah, to God, yes, uh, yes. Uh, you know, if he is our healer, we have to allow and to attribute what we see as cure weights, what we see as yeah. decreased morbidity and mortality to God since we are praying for healing and praying for, uh, for good health amongst all of us, actually. Right. Now, the gowns, too, they're going to start maybe back in the old days. I think we're reverting back to before plastics and all the bad stuff, which mm -hmm. is good, to start cleaning the gowns. They're going to start using cloth gowns. They talked about that also in one of the briefings and something I read, that we will start back. Remember a long time ago you used to see the shows uh, where, you, if you look at some of the old shows, uh, the nurses had on the white, the mm -hmm. white uh, outfit, cotton yes, outfit, yeah. and the little hat on her head. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of my nurses still did that. Aww. She wore her <laughs> white lab coat. And she wore her white, she used to get them pressed. And you're talking about the image of that uh, looks uh. so good. In fact, my first husband was a physician, and my mother used to always say when he would come in his white lab coat with uh -huh. his name, you look like a doctor today. Oh. So, I, and, you know, it does look better right. than some of the stuff uh, that is in healthcare today. Right. So I did want to show you all what PPE means. It's protective, personal protective equipment. And we're making a lot of advances. If you saw last week, we talked about all the changes that have been made in the court system and a lot mm -hmm. will last so now we have an actual test kit show us the, uh, exactly what what you do uh. all right this is actually not the uh, nasal pharyngeal swab because we don't have many of them left so I just brought a, a regular cotton swab but it's just for uh, an example but what we do for the uh, COVID test we can either swab your nose your nares or we can Put this all the way to your, uh, to your throat. Make sure that we get enough of the sample. We open this, which is actually the actual kit itself. We put the swab in here, put the top on, break it off. 
-hmm. close it. Then it has to go in the freezer because these are actually frozen tests. Mm. So the, uh, and that's the thing, it has to, uh, you have to do this in a freezer. So this goes in the freezer. Uh, most of my tests go to LabCorp because I have that, uh, that lab in the office. And now we're getting our test results back in about 48 hours. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. the courier picks up the test about 5 p.m. And I would say within 48 hours, we get the, uh, the result. Is there anything else we're getting ready to start closing it out uh, that you would like to leave? Any other uh, examples or what you would like to tell the audience, Dr. Brown? I think we've gone through pretty much everything, but it may be well, something I would else. say this is that God gave each one of us a temple, our bodies. We are to take care of it. And you can't expect somebody else to do a better job taking care of you than you. Mm -hmm. You know, don't put blame on the next person when this is your temple. Watch what you're putting in because we know how to eat better. To all of my diabetics, you know right from wrong. You know what you're doing wrong, but a lot of people just choose to do what they want to do. And then when things go wrong, there goes the finger pointing. Mm -hmm. But just remember, take care of yourselves. You, when you had your brand new car, you made sure that your oil changers were done. You made sure that you rotated those tires because you wanted to honor that warranty. Just know that the warranty on your life, we don't have a day or a time because nobody knows how long we're here. So this is that time to honor the warranty that God has given to each and every one of us, and that's called life. Hey, that's that preacher coming out in you, too, and that sounds really <laughs> good. And whenever you add God to the mix, we know we're doing the right thing. Right thing. Thank you very much. Come on back to Diane Andrews in black and white for the close. When I was a little girl growing up in Marouge, Louisiana, up in northern Louisiana, a little town, every Sunday this spiritual show would come on, and they would light a white candle. And it made such an impact on me and my life because what it was saying, if everyone lit just one little candle, what a great world this would be. With what we're going through, we still have to remember we're very blessed in America to have a stimulus package coming out, to have programs like this one showing you what you can do to protect yourself. We are having so much isolation that we need to occupy our minds with positive information and try to be around positive, positive people. If you're in a stage in your life that you want to change your life, not a better time to think inward. So thank you very much. God bless you. Stay safe. And we love you. I give you my heart. Bye-bye.